free. Often when I'm showing people the functionality of the law, they'll bring up this particular verse where Jesus said, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. I would point out that the position that I hold is that all is accomplished when Jesus said it was finished on the cross. When Jesus said it was finished, all was accomplished concerning his perfect obedient life under the law and then his atonement for his shedding of blood for our sins. But at this point that hadn't happened yet. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. He hadn't shed his blood. He was living under the law as the Bible says he was born of a woman born under the law and he came to speak to those under the law. And so in this Matthew chapter 5 Jesus is bringing the law to its ultimate stringency. And that when it comes to the law, you can't just do it the best you can. It has to be kept perfect and completely without fail. That's why the New Testament says, Cursed is all who rely on the works of the law, for cursed is everyone who doesn't continue to do all things in the book of the law to perform them. That if you're relying on the works of the law, you have to do them all. You have to do them perfectly and completely without fail. Jesus goes on to say in this passage in verse 19, Therefore, whoever nullifies the one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to stop right there. The only one who has kept the law and, and had taught the law perfectly was Jesus Christ. And he will be the one that is called great in the kingdom of heaven. No one is actually keeping the law. And so when the Bible says, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for only by the law comes the knowledge of sin. When it says, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in its sight, in its sight nobody's keeping the law to the perfect stringency that the law demands, because you have to do everything perfectly and completely. And Jesus taught that stringency as the law demanded it, and he taught the law, and he kept the law. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's the great thing about the gospel, according to the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul said, May I be found in him, having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. The Pharisees and the scribes were seeking a righteousness of their own through the law, but Paul said, may I be found in Jesus having a righteousness not of my own through the law. In other words, a righteousness that's not through my own personal obedience or performance, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. And God gives us that righteousness, Romans chapter 3, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. We're collectively and equally made righteous by our faith according to the gospel. And at this point, I always like to point out that it's through Jesus Christ's obedience to the law through which we're made righteous and not our own. Just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. So it's through the one man's obedience that the many are collectively and equally made righteous, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. So our righteousness does exceed the scribes and the Pharisees because we have even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe and there is no difference, and it's through the one man's obedience. One of the things I wanted to point out is that you know that the law has passed away for those who believe in Jesus Christ because the Bible teaches it very clearly that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be joined to another, that is, him has been raised from the dead. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. So we see from these verses, we've been freed from the law of Moses. We've died to the law. The law has come to its end. And the scripture says the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to faith in Christ. But once we've been justified by faith, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Once we've been justified by faith, which is a non-guilty verdict, we're no longer under the schoolmaster, which is a reference to the law. See, at this point, Jesus is using the law to its ultimate stringency so that people would see that their need for Christ, that they could never achieve righteousness through the law, that it was absolutely impossible and unattainable. 
the other thing I want to point out to show that the law has passed away because all has been accomplished, all has uh, been finished according to Jesus, is because when you consider right down here where in the same collection of passages, Jesus says this. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be answerable to the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go to fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar. See, this has to do with the law and the prophets, which had passed away when Jesus said it all has been finished. That before Jesus Christ shed his blood and he died on the cross, Jews would carry out all, uh, an altar sacrifice. This was something that was part of their tradition. It was a shadow, an archetype to represent the coming of Christ. But once Christ came and he shed his blood and he died on the cross, this has passed away. Jews no longer, Christian Jews, nor Christians themselves go to an altar and take any altar, to, uh, any sacrifice to the altar. And the reason why is because all has been accomplished. As Jesus said, all is finished. So Jesus said this right here in a certain context. Do not think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but, but to fulfill. For I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, when it comes to the unbelieving world, those who haven't put their faith in Christ, the law has not passed away for them. The law still stands, and they will be judged by that law on the day of judgment. The Bible says the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the law brings about the wrath of, of God, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. And that's for us who believe. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, so there's no law. Brothers and sisters, you have died to the law through the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's no law, so there's no transgression because we have died to the law. The law has come to its end. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things through which they could not be freed from through the law of Moses. We have been freed from the law, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. But that's for those who believe in these verses. For the unbelieving and those who haven't put their faith in Christ, they will be judged for every idle word that they speak and every single sin that they've ever committed. So when somebody comes up to you and tries to use that verse, well, Jesus says, you know, that his law wouldn't pass away until um, all was accomplished. Then you have to ask that person that, okay, that when you offend your brother, do you take uh, do you make it right before your brother before you go to the altar? And do you go to the altar because that's a part of the law and the prophets? See, Jesus said, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first to be reconciled to your brother. So for the person that says, well, the law hasn't passed away because Jesus is saying that all is accomplished and that has to do with some future date beyond the cross, well then you have to ask that person, are they doing their year, year, yearly sojourn out to the altar? Do they take an animal sacrifice out to the altar and do they make it right with their brother before they do that? See, it's absurd for someone to bring up that verse to act like as though the law hasn't passed away for those who believe, because none of them are yearly going out to the altar to carry out part of the law and the prophets. So we as Christians establish the law to an unbelieving world to show them it's impossible stringency, that it's a schoolmaster that's supposed to lead them to faith in Christ so that they would be justified by faith and not guilty verdict. Then they would be no longer under the schoolmaster, the thing that would show that they're guilty and unrighteous. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here in Matthew chapter 5. He shows you that even just a thought crime can put you in danger of eternal hellfire under the law. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, the people who were trying their best at the law to keep the law, 
thought, well, you know, I wasn't, com I'm not committing adultery, so I'm guiltless under the law. But Jesus comes along and says, no, that dirty thought that God sees that you had about that woman shows that you committed adultery in your heart. So you're guilty before God of adultery, but that a thought crime can put you into eternal fire before the eyes of a perfectly holy and just God. Remember, James chapter 2 says, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point is guilty of all of it. So if you're under the law and you're relying on the works of the law, you have to keep it perfectly and completely without fail because if you stumble at one point, you're guilty of all of it. So when we're understanding this verse about the uh, till all be accomplished, do not presume I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And remember, that is when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished. When, when Jesus died on the cross and said, and said, it is finished, according to Colossians chapter 3, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That when Jesus said it's finished, he made us holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation, completely independent from the law, but by God's grace. If you go back to the law to try to get righteous or right with God, you nullify the grace of God. Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness came to the law, then Christ died needlessly. If my rightness with God came through my compliance and obedience to the law, then Christ died needlessly. But when Christ died, it wasn't needlessly. He reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So I want to probably keep this video short here. I always want to ramble on, sometimes adding more on to the video. But I want to keep this short because I notice a lot of people have had a problem with this particular verse. Even people that I perceive to be well studied had a sticking point at this verse and have uh, the inability to rightly divide and understand the work of the cross, the functionality of the law, and this context here before Jesus shed his blood on the cross, died for our sins, the law was still in full effect. In terms of all those who were seeking to be justified or made right or righteous under it, you had to keep it perfectly and completely. It wasn't that God is just saying, look, do the best you can and I'll let you in. No, you have to keep it perfectly and completely without fail and nobody can do that. That's why the scripture says, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that the whole world would become guilty before God and every mouth would be stopped. That everyone under the law, they're just guilty. They have no righteous appeal in and of themselves to make before God. They need Jesus. So God bless you guys. Peace to you and take care. Heaven people with beautiful faces Many memories and wonderful places, but my Lord Jesus, you never let me down. Through the years and all of these changes, you've been my friend, never a stranger, and my Lord Jesus, you keep me heaven. Sisters and brothers, yeah. when the seasons have turned.